Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. So nice to see you around these parts again. Always love seeing your smiling faces, ready to learn some new things in the world of JavaScript and the web. Today's episode I was not expecting to make. And the reason for that is because I didn't know it existed until two days ago. This past week, there is a conference going on called React Conf and it's one of two or so major conferences in the US at least that is focused entirely on React. And at this conference, which happened past Thursday and Friday, the React core team announced a brand new React thing, which doesn't happen all that much. So when it does, it definitely makes sense to talk about it, don't you think? What they released this past week is this new thing called concurrent mode. It's currently experimental, it's not done, but they released it in a version that all of us out in the public, outside of the Facebook machine, can actually play with, which is very exciting. So today, we're going to do a little bit of a dive into what is concurrent mode. And to do this deep dive into React, we're going to be using the most excellent documentation pages about concurrent mode. There's five pages all about what concurrent mode is, explaining the theory behind it, the concepts behind it. And rather than me kind of repackage it up for you, uh, how about you just, you know, close close this tab and just read them yourselves. I, I, th I think that's enough for this video, right? You can just read these amazing documentation pages and just enjoy them and, and you got it. So we'll, we'll see each other next week after you're done reading the documentation pages, okay? Okay? Are you still here? Uh, that was a joke. Uh, uh, I wasn't joking about the documentation pages being incredible, uh, but let's actually review them together and hopefully I can add a little bit more color around them. They will definitely be our source material because uh, I don't have any secret knowledge about React. I'm just reading the docs myself, but hopefully I can take what I understand from them and hopefully explain them to you in a way that might help you learn why I'm so excited about React Concurrent Mode. So here we have the initial documentation page for React Concurrent Mode. The main thing that I wanna call out before we even move on because the React team themselves are being very aggressive about this as well, uh, this feature is experimental. It is not yet stable and things can change. It's experimental, things can change, it's being released right now for early adopters, library authors, people that want to kind of help form the direction of React. I'm sure some of the changes to concurrent mode will be a result of this being publicly available. It's always better to have things be in the open because then you have so many more people out in that universe that can help collaborate and improve upon things. The first thing, so I'm just gonna be going through these documentation pages and adding color to them. Uh, if you have any more questions about what I'm talking about, please do add a comment in the YouTube comments. Also, feel free to tweet at me. I want to help make these as understandable as possible. That's my goal. Hopefully, this video will help you with that. So the first question that you might be having, at least I was, is what is concurrent mode? Uh, a little bit of a history is that concurrent mode was actually initially announced, I think a year and a half ago, at a conference where the React team said, hey, this is a thing that's going to happen. And then there was like over a year of silence until to this past week when it was finally publicly released. So you may already be familiar about it, but in case you're not, concurrent mode, I mean, I'm gonna read directly what it says uh, on the page. It's a set of new features that help React stay responsive and gracefully adjust the user's device capabilities and network speed. Uh, what I find most interesting about concurrent mode is that rather than trying to win the horse race of benchmarking, so you have benchmarks with frameworks like what can complete a million of these tasks faster than a million of these tasks, like which framework is faster, React kind of said those are not the measurements that you should be looking at. There's other things that affect the quality of a user's experience on a web page. And one of the examples they have here down in this page is when you're typing in an input field with a list of items. If you have a long list of items and you have a filter at the top, you've definitely been in a situation where you're typing a query in that filter 
and the page kind of stutters. It gets slower because every time that you type a character into that input field, React has to then render the entire contents of that list. And that rendering is done synchronously and blocks the browser itself from updating anything on the page. And sure, you can definitely try and make that update as fast as possible, but at the end of the day, you're still gonna have to take X amount of time to render that page where nothing else can happen on the website. So what concurrent mode lets us do in a very large way is it changes the, mod, the mode in which React runs from a blocking mode to an interruptible mode. So that means that in the old React, that's how things currently work, what I just described. With concurrent mode, when you type in that input field and it's rendering that content, when it's rendering that content, let's say you type in a new character, React can say, hold up, somebody just typed in a new character in that input field. I really should show them that they type that in, otherwise they're going to be confused and think that your website is engineered poorly, both of which we know is not true. Users, it's always the user's fault, right? Um, but React can pause that list, rendering that list, and actually say, okay, let me actually render that input field. It can actually interrupt what it's doing to actually make that page feel responsive. And that's not a thing you can really benchmark, benchmark, benchmark. So it's just kind of shifting the focus of what React's trying to do, just make you be able to write better and more responsive applications. What I just described is largely described in this section on the documentation page. So if you like to read it, and kind of rehear what I'm saying, uh, you can see this, but this is what I was just saying, is that concurrent mode fixes this limitation by making rendering interruptible. So you can have the input field updated and not the list at that time. What's also the concurrent mode lets us do, and I'm trying to say what concurrent mode can do, and then we can kind of talk about the theory behind it, like how it's the abstract way in which it's working, which I think is also good to know, and they do describe in the documentation pages. With concurrent mode, you can actually be intentional with how you show loading indicators. So if you're loading a page and there's, you know, the there's two sections that require data that each do their loading individually, each one will have its loading indicator. With concurrent mode, you can actually collapse those indicators to just show one. So rather than having 10 spinners on your page, which is way too much noise for a user, through concurrent mode, through this new component called suspense, you're gonna actually collapse those into one, which makes for a more native feeling application, but also one that gives you, the developer, more control over how it behaves. So at this point, you might be wondering, how does concurrent mode work? And the metaphor that I love best, I mean, so they have a metaphor in here. They, they using the metaphor of version control, which I'll let you read to have one example down there, but essentially what concurrent mode adds to React is that React, at any given point in time, has two versions of your application in memory. You have the version that's currently being shown to the user, and then there's the version that your code is, kind of, is trying to work on. It sounds a little bit confusing. So for a concrete example, so let's say you have a list of users that you want to then click to go to one of those users' actual details page. Uh, React, as it behaves right now, would only be able to have one version of that transition in memory. So let's say you want to click that user and then you want to either load that data in the list page and then when it's done, then update what you're rendering to then show that next one. Then React could do that. Or you could click that route to the next page and start rendering all that right away. React will just has one version of that in memory. With concurrent mode, what can actually happen is, let's say you have the loading of that data being done in the actual details page. When you click that user's detail page, with concurrent mode, what React can do now is actually say, okay, I'm gonna start trying to render that details page and then realize that I don't have the data for it. And it'll wait for that data to load. And while, when that data loads, it can actually render that page in memory. And once it's all done, it can then go from the list page to the detail page all at once. It doesn't have to wait for loading indicators to show, uh, to have awkward code to kind of make this feel better. It's all done built into React where you have your application code telling the React code how you want it to behave. Um, the funny thing about, about concurrent mode is that not all, but some of the more interesting examples that they show can be done today in React, but it becomes very hard to do 
and also very almost impossible to do at scale for large applications. So concurrent mode is kind of exposing the, it's, it's providing, and the example they use in the docs, which is lovely, is that concurrent mode is a car engine and the car itself is what you build using concurrent mode and suspense and all these other APIs that they're providing. It's exposing some very wonderful raw functionality that you can kind of build on top of to have your application behave the way that you want it to. Hopefully that makes sense. The metaphor they use here is with Git branches where you have master branch and you can actually do a Git branch to a work in progress state of your UI. When that's done, you can then merge it to master all at once. The, 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 there's this thing called double buffering in computer graphics, which I find also to be a wonderful metaphor. Uh, if you ever play, there, there's a, a very common way of doing computer games where um, if you're in some video game and you're looking straight ahead, you can see the grass, the trees, the mountains, you can see all that. If you were to then turn right, what video games do today is when you turn right, rather than showing you first the grass, then the trees, like incrementally showing you things as it actually renders it, like the grass, the trees, the mountains, what a video game will do is actually say, okay, this person has to see this whole new terrain, and I'm gonna take the grass, the trees, the mountains, build it all in memory, and when it's all done, show it all at once. So it feels more immersive, more real, and not as janky where things are like kind of popping in here and there. It does it all in memory, it's called double, double buffering. It puts it all into memory, renders it there, and then shows it to the user all at once. And that's how most games behave nowadays. So some of those concepts are now being stolen and wonderfully applied to just regular old web application development. So another question you might be having is, how do you use concurrent mode? And there are some new, I think there's one new component. It's not even actually new. It's been around for a while. It's new, this component called Suspense, which has been around since React 16.6. And it's a way, so uh, if you see my other videos, you know about error boundaries. It's a way to kind of encapsulate, you know, if there's an error in some component, an error boundary will catch that and let you kind of control how you want to handle that and show the UI to the behavior. A suspense boundary also does the same thing for when some data is not yet ready yet or some asynchronous process is not yet ready. It's in suspense. Um, currently with React right now, you can actually use suspense for code splitting if you have some async component that you want to load uh, incrementally and not have to bundle into the main application. You can use Suspense right now, right here. Uh, what they've released now in this experimental build is adding support for you to declaratively wait for anything, including data. Uh, the other examples they have here are images. If you have some images that takes a while to load, you can actually tell React how you want to behave as it's loading that image on the page, scripts, or other anything asynchronous. So this is what concurrent mode with Suspense mostly looks like. There's the there's this thing up here which actually triggers the async call to actually load some data. I'm not going to go into it too deep right now. We have the page that has um, the two suspense components that wrap both profile details and profile timeline. And both of these themselves are actually trying to read from that async data information. And what's interesting here is that how this behaves on the page, which actually you can see with the built-in examples. There's wonderful examples in these docs pages. Um, do you see that right there? Where you have, first it's loading the profile, then it shows Ringo Star, and then it's showing the content there. So uh, this loading profile, the way that suspense works is that it will catch any async data that's contained within it. The reason why there's two suspense boundaries here is that the timeline data takes longer to load than the details data. If we had actually moved this out to be here, what this does is it says that it, it, it's, it's almost like a promise.any because these are async promises that are being waited on. Um, this is a promise.any in this case where you're saying, wait, Sorry, promise.all, promise.all. Uh, don't do anything, like like wait until all this data is ready before you show it. That's why when you load it here, you see loading profile and that's it. It's waiting for all the data to be there and then show it, which is what most React applications behave right now. When you actually have it inside of here, what you've done is said, you know, this suspense boundary is waiting for the data in here. This creates a new suspense boundary that says wait for the data in here. And because you have 
that you, you've now essentially made two separate promises where you have now, um, instead of uh, promise.all um, details and timeline, which is the version we had before, we now have promise, we just have, uh, I think it's just going to be promise. It's just, it, it, they're just separate. There's just no promise at all. They're just allowed to run independently. There's no um, grouping of them together, which is why we see in this example, when you refresh it, you see initially loading profile. That data gets there first. So when that data gets here first, it says, okay, I can load that details page. But because we're still waiting for the data from timeline, it then starts showing loading posts right there. And that's kind of the raw example of what Suspense lets you do. I'm not going to get into the how right now. That's not going to fit in this video. Uh, but that's kind of the behavior of it. Another awesome example that they have in Docs pages that I really want to show is how with concurrent mode and Suspense, it becomes easier to make UI that looks like this, where it's kind of hard to trace what's going on here. But when I hit Next, it's showing a loading indicator. And you can kind of see this data incrementally update because we define suspense boundaries around these things that lets us actually define how we want to load data. Uh, what's really cool is that if you click next enough, there's some times where this API call will happen underneath our bounds of timeout. So with suspense, you can set a timeout saying, um, if this async call happens for more than three seconds, then show the user that I'm actually waiting for things. If it takes less than three seconds, then never tell the user anything has changed at all because it's just gonna add noise and cause things to jump around that isn't necessary. Uh, loading, so John Lynn updates, then the text updates, and it's kind of a graceful waterfall of things being updated on the page. And then you can see also how the text slightly gets grayed out here. It might be a little bit hard to see. Uh, we'll do this, we'll do 0.5, thumbness of this, this, and it goes there like that. Uh, so you can kind of have this, I mean, you could think where you're having a table of users and you're trying to page the next one um, let's say that API call takes, you know, two seconds to load. You'll click that button for the next page and then disable the button so people can't smash it. But then if it takes less than two seconds, then just, it'll just update that next table when it's all there rather than loading a empty page that then shows and jumps things in. Um, if it takes longer than two seconds, you can actually say, hold on, take them to the next page, showing an indicator inside of there before the actual content shows in. So it gives you that flexibility to kind of control how things work. Okay, hopefully that was enough of an overview about wh what concurrent mode is, how suspense works. I apologize if it was a little meandering. Uh, it's still a lot of information that I'm trying to soak up and trying to figure out the best way to explain it for you. Uh, I'm trying to make maybe more videos that kind of focus on one part of concurrent mode because this is kind of a broad overview about what concurrent mode is, why it's exciting, and how you can actually use it for your applications. Not today, it's still experimental, but if you have a pet project that's not uh, money sensitive, then sure, you can use that for there. I actually definitely want to play with this, making an application, kind of see how it feels to use these new APIs. Um, to use concurrent mode, it's not free. You definitely have to have your, your React application be strict mode compliant to actually work with concurrent mode, which means that if you have a very old application, uh, the example they have in their docs is that uh, Facebook's old website is probably never going to get to concurrent mode. They have this intermediate thing called blocking mode to kind of get some features of concurrent mode, but not all of them. But it's so old, it's too hard to migrate. They've actually made an entirely new website that's being built with concurrent mode from the ground up, which is what sometimes might be required. Or you have sections of your site that um, you kind of split apart and work with just concurrent mode. Hopefully that helps you understand what it is. Um, curious to hear your thoughts in the comments. Hopefully, hoping to answer any questions you might have while you were following along. Very curious to hear your feedback. Uh, stay tuned for more as we kind of delve deeper into what concurrent mode is. And I look forward to seeing your smiling faces again next week. Bye.